investiture will focus the attention of the whole world on the principality. The investiture itself was the culmination of a number of events. They were all, from our point of view, deliberately offensive. It will be an occasion for monarchy and state to walk together in harmony, as they have done for so many years now. They were throwing gauntlets down. And someone had to pick them up. When you came to Wales, of course, there was quite a lot of strong anti-English nationalist feeling. Is it something that you come to understand, come to comprehend since you've been in Wales? You see, I think they feel so strongly about Wales as a nation, and, and it means something to them, and they're, they're depressed by, you know, what, what might happen to it if they don't try and preserve the language and the culture, which is very unique and special to Wales. And if something is unique and special, I see it's well worth preserving. Well, it's now just 10 minutes to midnight time on BBC One for us to wish you a very good night. Good night. Yn ystod y nos, neithiwr, fe ddigwyddodd yr hyn roedd ni i gyd wedi bod yn niofni ers misoedd. I believe that the nationalists of Wales have created a monster they cannot control. They have created an atmosphere in which violence of this sort is seen as the logical end of their philosophy. We in Wales were the local arm, as it were, of a worldwide movement. A worldwide movement, a protest against the, the old established orders of the imperial order, which had led to two world wars and so on. Young people saying that they wanted a better future for the countries. We want a new order which puts people and their cultures first. So the irony of the investiture is that it happens at the end of the 1960s, the end of a decade of extraordinarily tumultuous politics, decolonization, student revolution, the pill, the expectation of equality. It's absolutely huge. Everybody has changed, and this family wasn't. In their island, what they do is reinstate this antique ceremony purporting to be about 600 years old, except they've made it up. The promise of the investiture ceremony had been made in Cardiff over a decade earlier. The British Empire and Commonwealth Games in the capital have made this a memorable year for the Principality. I intend to create my son Charles Prince of Wales today. When he is grown up, I will present him to you at Carnarvon. I remember sitting in the, in the headmaster's study at uh, Cheam, and uh, th th we were all watching the television, and there were several other boys there, you know, little ones. I remember being acutely embarrassed when, when it was announced, you know, and I had this marvelous great cheer coming from the stadium in Cardiff. And uh, I think for a little boy of nine, it was rather bewildering. Charles is a frightened, subdued soul. The Queen tells him, across a public address system, for goodness sake, that he's going to be anointed the Prince of Wales. This is a very odd way 
of being a family, but it's a guarantee of the duty of the sons. This is the way that the royal family was really operating at this point. You are told something, you put up with it, you deal with it, and you cope with it. And it's really hard for Prince Charles because he's a very sensitive child, he's a very thoughtful child, and this weighs heavily on him. He really is expected to just accept it and, and get on with it. The idea of the 1969 investiture was popular in Wales. A Western male poll at the time suggested that the majority of Welsh people welcomed their new prince with enthusiasm, without ever questioning his historical right to that title. Wales has always been regarded as something of a poodle. And I think the principle was that we had to show that this was not uh, a sentiment shared by everyone and that there were some people who remembered a bit further back. One of those who questioned the legitimacy of this unfolding ceremonial was a man who had pledged his life to serve Queen and country, a young army sergeant called John Jenkins, who single-handedly took it upon himself to reorganise and mobilise an underground movement called MAC, Midyad Amdiffin Cymru, against the most public display of state power this small country had seen in recent years. John Jenkins was born in 1933 and raised in Treharis and then Penabryn in the Rumney Valley. He was the son of a miner and he described his childhood as idyllic. The young John wasn't raised as a Welsh speaker, but he was fascinated by history and his Celtic roots. In particular, he was captivated by Capel Gladys, an ancient site on Gellig Gael Common, close to his home in Penabryn. It's a place he would return to many times in his life. He played drums in the local kazoo band, and his love of the drums and the outdoors would take him into the army. He joined the Dental Corps in 1951, and he was to be in and out of the army for the next 20 years. Cyprus, in keeping with British anxiety that the frequent riots may lead to bloodshed, our troops have exchanged their arms for riot sticks and shields. By the summer of 1958, John Jenkins is posted to Cyprus. What's going on in Cyprus at that time is the Aorca campaign, which is against um, British rule on the island. After four years of an insurgency in which police bases and military bases are targeted, Cyprus is, is handed back its independence, and John realises that this has been achieved with only a, a handful, a comparatively small number of men. The British Empire flourishes because of the coal fields in South Wales, because of the, the iron, the steel, not just in South Wales, not just from the slate from North Wales, but it's an integral part of the imperial story. But by the 60s, that empire is, is dead, essentially. The empire is crumbling. Those opportunities that were there in the empire are no longer there the coal fields are beginning to fail, so that you see unemployment uh, amongst the coal miners increase in the 1960s. With Welsh industry in slow decline, water was perhaps the only natural resource that Wales had left in abundance. Dams had been built and valleys drowned since Victorian times. But it was the proposal by Liverpool Corporation to create yet another reservoir at Capel Kellyn that was to bring the Welsh nationalist spirit to life. For many in Wales, the drowning of the village of Capel Kellyn in the Trewerin Valley was the defining political event of their generation. Despite protests on the streets of Liverpool, numerous petitions, and a vote by every Welsh MP against the proposed scheme, the drowning of the valley went ahead. 
John Jenkins. Political flowering really begins with witnessing what is happening with the flooding of Trewerin. I mean, he's in Germany at the time. He sees that there are 36 Welsh MPs, not one of whom votes in support of the bill. And yet, having exercised this democratic opposition, the voice of Wales is ignored. But he thinks something's wrong here when a nation such as Wales can be hit over the head so badly, then where do we go from here? Where does that leave us? For some people it said, there is no political democratic solution to this. And the only way we can win our freedom, the only way we can look after Welsh interests is not through the ballot box, but through some kind of violence. And Trewerin does see the emergence of violence as a political tool um, within Wales. The following year, on his return to Wales, John Jenkins was to bear witness to one of the most horrific man-made disasters of the industrial age, in a town that was close to his heart. BBC One continues now earlier than published with 24 hours. don't know how to begin. Never in my life have I ever seen anything like this. I hope that I shall never ever see anything like it again. This is one of many valleys in South Wales, in the South Wales coalfield tonight. It's a very special valley. It's a valley that contains death. 116 children and 28 adults were killed when the slurry from a coal tip engulfed the local junior school. I began to feel discredited in many ways in that I was a member of, of, of a nation which was downtrodden and which was suffering. It was my mother's home, you see, for a start, and uh, I felt it very deeply. It was a combination of various factors, which did include Truerin and did include Abervan. Those are the things which, which made me realise that something must be done. That summer had seen a significant victory for the nationalist movement in Wales, with Plaid Cymru, the Welsh Nationalist Party, winning its first parliamentary by-election in Carmarthen in July 1966, making Gwynvor Evans the first ever Welsh Nationalist MP at Westminster. When we look at independence movements, they're always an amalgamation of different interest groups. A campaign for national independence or national self-determination that is successful is a campaign that is able to bring together all sorts of different perspectives. We see that to an extent in Wales in the 1960s. The success of Plaid Cymru, for example, demonstrates that increasingly more and more people are willing to detach themselves from the two major political parties in Wales. But Gwynvor Evans would struggle to reconcile his position as Plaid Cymru's only representative in Parliament with the demands of other groups within the growing movement for Welsh independence. Cymdeithas was founded in 1962 to try and get official status for the Welsh language, to get road signs in Welsh, um, official forms in Welsh, was part of the awakening of realising that our language was not something which was dying out, but was part of a, a living, new, young enthusiasm for Wales, a, a young revolution in, in Wales. You have Cymdeithas Sir Iaith that are, that are committed to direct action, but Cymdeithas Sir Iaith are also an organisation which is committed to pacifist means. And then you have groups like MAC and the FWA who are committed to a more violent campaign of disobedience, of disruption, of terrorism, if one likes. At Machantleth, the young people met to express through a protest march their dissatisfaction with the situation in Wales. These rallies drew together a variety of organisations, the Free Wales Army, the Young Patriots League, the Patriotic Front, the Anti-Sice League, 
and it's open to question how far these various groups enjoyed shared objectives and shared membership. Well, the FWA started as, uh, you know, two or three people got together, people like Keo and Dennis Coslett especially, a couple of farmers that were related to Keo. Okay, you had a privileged boyhood and uh, education. Uh, you know, public, you went to two or three public schools, I think. <laughs> Expelled from two or three of them as well. Oh, I spent a lot of time at, at uh, Kayo's home. It was a small mansion, it was a lovely, lovely place. He was a throwback, you know, from the days of the princes. That's when he should have been alive, in fact. The days of Glyndwr and Llewellyn. <laughs> He'd have loved it. There were many non-Welsh speakers in the FWA, uh, especially those from Ronda, Merthyr, um, places like that. And they joined the FWA, I think, because they didn't feel as if they fitted in with Pai Company because of the language. Uh, they wrongly thought that he had to speak Welsh. And the FWA became a natural home for many of these disenchanted Valleys people. We'll make a stand and prove to the world, for once and for all, that we are a nation, that we will stand on our feet. At least we have made the dismal pages of Welsh history a little more exciting. Caio is in the uh, South Wales borders, and he fought in Malaya against the communist insurgents. And he always hated communism from then on, and anything left-wing. It was a strange concoction, you know, Republican on one side and a rampant right-winger on the other. <laughs> Destroy the flag of tyranny. That's it. What he, Kayo, is able to see in Malaysia is similar to what John Jenkins is able to see later on in in Cyprus, which is that he sees these small groups of individuals cause disproportionately large political and social effects through the use of violence. But they also find that these groups are very elusive. Kayo in particular finds that um, in Malaysia the guerrillas can just disappear. And that, of course, is very similar to the way the Welsh have waged warfare for centuries back in medieval times. The landscape of Wales is very rugged, is very rural. And if you look at the ways the campaigning of, for example, Owen Glyndwr, there's a big emphasis on small, what we might now call, guerrilla tactics. Dog Dam, a huge construction which is being built near Llanidloes, was to become the target of the more extreme Welsh nationalists. In 1966, it was nearing its completion when the police received a warning that a bomb had been planted on the site. Eight pounds of gelignite had been placed under an 80-foot steel mast that was connected to another by 110 feet of three-inch cable. It exploded, sending the entire construction cascading down the hillside. Speculation was rife about who might have been responsible, but an olive green Castro cap found 30 feet from the scene seemed to point the finger conclusively towards Caio Evans and his men. I don't think it has been worn by anybody who undertook the operation. It was dropped deliberately by somebody, put it that way. Two hundred people were questioned throughout Wales, one of whom was Gwynfor Evans. So in the dark are they, I think, as to who might be responsible, whatever their suspicions. The Clawedog explosion had in fact marked the return of a shadowy organisation which had been started back in 1962 in reaction to Truerin. This was MAC, Midyad and Diffin Cymru, the movement for the defence of Wales. Most members of then MAC were well known by everyone including the authorities. So therefore, any action that had to be undertaken had to be undertaken by someone who wasn't known, and I certainly wasn't known. On his return from Germany in 1966, 
John Jenkins started to reorganise Mac. He was based at Wrexham, at the dental unit in Satan Barracks. As a non-combatant in the army, he had the perfect cover. He was a low security risk, and his job required him to travel around the country. Plus, his role in training the TA band brought him into contact with a new source of potential recruits. Some people would come up and say, oh, so-and-so is a good lad, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's really raring to go. And if he then proved beyond any doubt that he was the right sort of material, he would be recruited and he would then recruit his own cell. One or two people at the most, no more. You know your immediate two or three people in the cell and you may know the one superior person above that, but you don't know anybody else. They wouldn't even know how to contact me. I would contact the leader of that cell. He was the only one who knew my face. He didn't know who I was, didn't know where I was from, nothing. I would suddenly appear because I would know where he was all the time. One of John Jenkins' first recruits was to be a 19-year-old flautist in the TA band called Frederick Ernest Alders. It was to be Alders who would drive John Jenkins to a small village in Mid Wales called Llanrhea de Ramochnant to plant his first bomb as Mac's new leader. Most of the villagers who heard the loud explosion thought it was thunder. The explosion caused this gash about seven feet across. Every pipe carries 12 million gallons of water a day to Liverpool. Detectives found a piece of fuse, a small lead plate, a spring, and a brass cover which could have been part of a timing device. They did not find, as reported in some newspapers, any Free Wales Army caps there at all. While the Mac bombers were creating havoc for the authorities, the Labour Party was waking up to the threat of mainstream nationalist politics. The rapturous, adoring supporters of the first Welsh nationalist ever elected to Westminster. Is Gwynfor Evans's triumph merely a quirk of history, or is he the standard bearer of a new Welsh rebellion? The Labour Party in Wales, yes, they were surprised, but it wasn't something that overshook them because in the Welsh heartland, in West Wales, containable. But then a year later, when Ron the West almost went to Plaid, you know, that was really serious business because now Plaid Cymru had come to the door, to the front door, of the Welsh Labour heartland. Somehow, whoever it was, they must have thought back, they must have known their Welsh history, how the investiture of 1911 that Lloyd George himself thought of, how popular that appeared and came across Wales. Someone must have thought, hey, this is what we need to do. For the Labour Party, reviving the investiture ceremony now seemed like a timely political move. There was an understanding, I think, on the part of Labour MPs that the royal family was a lot more popular than one might appreciate if one just listened to the nationalist narrative, and that by holding such a, an ostentatious uh, demonstration of royal power uh, and of unionist power in the capital of Welsh nationalism, they would be cocking a snook at any kind of move towards a more nationalistic Wales. When the Labour government announced that the investiture was to take place at Carnarvon on the 1st of July, 1969, it provided a new focus for the nationalists in Wales. Cymdeithas yr Iaith prepared themselves for a new wave of protest and with the first meeting to discuss the investiture arrangements to take place in Cardiff in November, all eyes were on the capital city. The Free Wales Army, of course, took up the cause and in their own unique style were using every opportunity to draw attention to themselves. With Dennis Coslett, Cayo's loyal lieutenant, getting interviewed on national television by David Frost. Tell me a little about the Free Wales Army. What does it stand for? Well, we are a militant group. We are not pacifists. Uh, we are neither conscious. We are prepared to fight for our freedom. Fight for your freedom uh, yes. against whom? From, from the imperialist government. The, the, the Free Wales Army did have its role to play within the militant arena. They were visual. 
they were vocal, and they did succeed in, in diverting resources and attention from the real bombers. What sort of things have you done so far? Oh, well, we've caused a lot of uh, damage to your pipelines. How have you done that? How have we done it? Mm. Well, we've just put plastic on your on the establishment's pipelines and blasted away. The, the FWA did Mac uh, a great favour. They took all the publicity while Mac uh, could act uh, surreptitiously. Nobody knew who they were, where they were from, where they'd strike next. On November the 17th, 1967, the Investiture's Organising Committee was to meet at the Temple of Peace in Cardiff. John Jenkins, as Mac's new leader, was acutely aware of the opportunity this presented. John decides that every time a member of the royal family or those involved in the organisation of the ceremony steps into Wales, there will be an explosion. In the early hours of the morning, on the day of the investiture meeting, a 15-pound bomb exploded in the Temple of Peace. Roads out of the city were immediately sealed off. And within an hour of the blast, known extremists throughout Wales had been roused from their beds questioning. A frantic effort was made to prepare the building for the meeting, which was due to take place in the Grand Hall at 11.30 that morning. The Queen had appointed a... I believe that the nationalists of Wales have created a monster they cannot control. They... George Thomas became a bit of a caricature uh, of someone who hated uh, the Welsh language, even though they were Welsh, and who gravitated towards an English monarchy. Royalty, the royal family, was very, very, very important to George. Hugely important. Gwynorio Jones, who was an official of the um, Welsh Labour Party before he became an MP, for example, used to visit George uh, at his home. He walked into the lounge, either side of the fireplace, you know, two feet by three feet type of size, both sides, the Queen and Prince Charles. Amazing. Funny thing to keep in your lounge, isn't it? The first appointment of the day for George Thomas, MP, Secretary of State for Wales. Breakfast with Mam. Even though the announcement of the investiture was in the days of Clidwin Hughes, the carrying out of the process, that was George's responsibility, and I bet you he must have loved it. He really, he would have been in his element. The Prime Minister said to me, and next year, George, you will have the investiture of Prince Charles. Well, at that stage, I didn't think it was going to involve any uh, problems, because I thought, well, that's right, it'll be a very pleasant occasion, but a full stop. But of course, we had a lot of anxieties first. A device had been placed on a basement windowsill and the blast, which was heard three miles away, blew in doors and threw furniture around. No sooner had George Thomas become Secretary of State than Mac strike again, audaciously blowing up his headquarters at the Welsh office. Minister, do you think that, uh, say, Home Rule for Wales would stop this sort of thing? Not at all. A Home Rule for Wales isn't wanted by the Welsh people. You'd start a lot more trouble if you tried to give home rule to Wales. What we are seeking for is a greater sense of participation in the work of the government. Prince Charles, on a visit to the Welsh office, has his first experience of anti-investiture protest. But the throwing of smoke bombs evoked little sympathy for the protesters, who were accused of, in the words of one church leader, ignorant discourtesy to a young man who is in no way responsible for the position in which he finds himself. La 
Well, I was um, I was a student in uh, University College, happy as he was in, at the time. Prince Charles was to be seconded to Aberystwyth for six weeks of the summer term, during which time he's going to learn the Welsh language, he's going to learn everything about Welsh history and um, Welsh culture, so that he'd be acceptable then as Prince of Wales. It was quite a surprise when I learned that I was going to be sharing lectures with um, the Prince of Wales. I wasn't very excited about that, in fact, I thought it was pretty awful. I thought it was quite ridiculous that he would spend a term and learn all he needed to know. There we go, not my choice, uh, but when I was chosen by my fellow students to be the chair of Plaid Cymru in the university, uh, it did become a bit of my business, I have to say, because we became then um, open to persuasion by the authorities to behave ourselves and not to engage in what was called immature protest against the prince. I received a letter from the principal at Aberystwyth University and there was a, an envelope inside an envelope and this was marked as to be opened only by the Secretary of State for Wales personally. So I opened it and in it he expressed his grave anxiety for the physical security of Prince Charles. I couldn't keep this to myself. I had to report it to the Prime Minister, Harold Wilson, who said to me, what is your advice, Secretary of State? I said, to proceed. They, we cannot have a part of the United Kingdom where a member of the royal family dare not go for safety reasons. We must proceed. The secret police were there at work in the college in Aberystwyth at the time. They had two functions. One was a legitimate function, to ensure the personal safety of someone who was the heir to the British throne. But they were also there to ensure that the British state was not politically embarrassed. When uh, we held our protest, the day in which he arrived at the college, I climbed onto the roof of the old college building and I tore up some pieces of paper and I dropped them down as confetti to mark the, the marriage of the University College of Wales with the British establishment that they were willing to sell out to be used for a blatantly political purpose. I was told later on that police marksmen were on four as a nearby roofs with their rifles trained at me. So at the time, so had it even seemed that I was dropping anything more sinister than a tiny bit of paper, uh, I'd have been taken out immediately, therefore. Mr. Milward, as one of the Prince's tutors, you've been putting the final touches to his timetable today. Just how rigorous a syllabus will it be? It's quite a heavy syllabus. He'll have his plate uh, quite full during these nine weeks, and uh, he's very willing to work hard. It was very strange to be in Edward Millward's company because he was vice chair of Pride Cymru in Aberystwyth and he was a member of staff and he was the tutor who was teaching Prince Charles Welsh. And he was one of the people who was most concerned that Pride Cymru, uh, the University of Pride, Pride Cymru responded maturely and sensibly and didn't make fools of ourselves or the prince. But he was felt by the students to have sold out to the institutions by um, cooperating so enthusiastically. There have been stories that you've had rather a, a lonely time at the University of Wales at Aberystwyth. Is this so? Well, it is. I, I wonder where these reports come from, but I suppose they circulate. Um, I, you see, the trouble is that one has to remember that I'm in a slightly different position from several other people. And I think they try and put themselves in my position too much. I think uh, out of certain necessity, I've uh, perhaps been more lonely, if they like it. I mean, I, I haven't made a lot of friends, if, if that's what they mean. and. Uh, 
I haven't been to a lot of parties or anything. There haven't been very many. And I've had a lot of other things to do. I've, I mean, I've been around Wales a lot and looked at things and visited people. And essentially it is, I suppose, compared with other people's lives, more lonely. And in this sense, I suppose I've had a lonely time. He would arrive to the back door of the college in his sports car. Uh, he would be accompanied by several policemen, uh, and two of them would guard his car. Uh, and then he would go in for the university lecture halls. Students would be there already. He would come in, he would sit in the front of the lecture hall, and there would be two policemen outside the door to ensure his safety. Also learned the Welsh language. Did you find that very difficult? Because most English tongues find it very difficult to get round. Well, it, I think all languages are difficult, but I suppose there are certain things. I mean, the double L's are, are terrible. Well, they were fairly difficult, except that I went to Llanelli not long ago, and the mayor said, can you say Llanelli? So I said, Llanelli, and he wiped the saliva out of his eye and said, well done. But it's, you know, the... the, the there is a way of doing it. You, know, you put your tongue in a certain place and blow. The speaking Welsh, like, you know, is, um, uh, it's, a, it's a trick and it's worked because he's done a very short course in a language laboratory which has taught him how to pronounce words. And he he's always read, he reads it off the paper. Rydwy wedi sunni at el hoch gystedlaethau yn y sefydliad rhagorol yma. Ac rydwy wedi cael blas arbennig. Are a canny brood, a fair sign. Canny morbrood, villa bethain da, a kail chigid, and har narvan. Prince Charles has won over the hearts of uh, most of the middle aged women, especially. Uh, and this has been effective, you know, and the ceremony itself was cooked up more or less for the 1911 ceremony at Carnarvon uh, by Lloyd George. And uh, it was then a political gimmick, and to a great extent, it is now also a political gimmick. Well, this picture is uh, a very splendid picture of the presentation of the very first English Prince of Wales to be presented to the Welsh people in uh, 1284. And this little fellow here is the actual Prince of Wales being held by his dad, King Edward I. And here are the painters of this splendid picture. There's Ian, Lynn and Mark. Hello. Uh -huh. Now, of course, there is the famous story that uh, the Welsh would ref had said they were going to refuse to have any, any Prince of Wales who didn't speak Welsh. And so Edward tricked them and he brought out his newborn son, who spoke no language at all, and said, here is a Prince of Wales who doesn't speak English. That is a complex moment of, of myth-making, really, uh, because actually the investiture of Edward II took place over in Lincoln, uh, in East England, rather than Carnarvonshire in 1301, 17 years later. And no ceremony was recorded, and certainly nothing happened in Carnarvon, um, because Edward wasn't there. So when we think about these ceremonies, we've got to think about an idea first coined by historian David Canadine, that was the invention of tradition. Uh, the monarchy stress through staging royal ceremonies in more public ways, that this stuff is old, that it has a long tradition reaching back hundreds of years, if not a thousand years, when in fact all of the, the pageantry, the pomp and circumstance, the colour, the gold, the glitz that we associate with the modern British monarchy, a lot of it's come from the 19th century it, as a way of sort of articulating a sense of shared history and heritage that unites the nation as a whole. 1969 is definitely a departure from 1911 in terms of the way the ceremony looks and feels. And instrumental to the changes is the figure of Lord Snowden, Anthony Armstrong Jones, who had, at the start of the decade in 1960, married the Queen's younger sister, Princess Margaret. And in his approach to the ceremony in 69, he tries to incorporate um, all of the sort of the feel of the 1960s, that it is a more modern ceremony. I think that when I did it, there are certain people um, thought I was going to be a whiz kid and um, do an ultra-modern thing. Actually, it was very traditional. And if... Um, it's sort of like what Henry V would have done if he'd had perspex. I wanted it to be romantic, I wanted to uh, be good on television, that was the only thing. I did not want it to be an elitist ceremony. In the stage management of a national occasion, 
there's never been such a bias towards television before. Scarcely a battlement here without its cameras. And under the guiding hand of Lord Snowden, the castle has become a kind of medieval television studio. I mean, it would be madness to design it just for the few inside. I must design it for the 500 million viewers, which is believed to be watching. And the rehearsal started where the procession itself will start, at the special Royal Railway platform built near a factory two miles from the town. It was one of the biggest security uh, the country had ever seen at that time. There were nearly two and a half thousand police officers. They came from everywhere, including the plain clothes. I think there were about a thousand of those, one and a half thousand nearly uniformed officers. To organize such an event was, was enormous. The, the gentleman in charge, the, the uh, Duke of Norfolk, uh, he was an experienced coordinator of, of such events, but the biggest danger is if you pre-tell everybody where you're coming, how you're going to do, where you're going to walk, a good terrorist can either have a sniper, an explosion, or what have you, and that's how, if I was going to attack anybody, how I'd do it. The discovery of a bomb near Holyhead Pier, where the Royal Yacht was due to visit, intensified police fears over security. Three men were arrested, but their connection to Mac was never proved. Hello and good evening from Carnarvon on the eve of the investiture. The town which seems about to explode as the sightseers pour into the streets to... John Jenkins, meanwhile, was hiding in plain sight, right under the noses of the security forces. Still a sergeant in the British Army, he had managed to get himself stationed at a temporary army camp in Carnarvon, from where he was directing his bombers. The night before the investment, there were four groups out. And the object of the exercise was to disrupt the ceremony and to cause as much uproar as possible. One was a, a, a bomb placed somewhere near the, where the, where the um, royal family court would be coming down not near enough to cause any damage, but near enough to cause uproar. Another was placed in the chief constable's garden, and that was timed to create a 22-gun salute rather than a 21-gun salute. And another one was to blow up a pier at which the Royal Yacht was due to harbour, which meant it wouldn't be able to harbour because there was no pier there. The fourth device was to be set in Abergele, 35 miles up the coast from Carnarvon, by two MAC operatives, Alwyn Jones and George Taylor. John has insisted that he instructed the cell leader, Alwyn Jones, to target a government installation in the town, a social security office, because Abigail is en route to Carnarvon, and John is, is aware that the Royal Train will be passing through Abigail on its way to Carnarvon. I know people like to say, oh, the Royal Train, because it makes good copy. It was not true. We did not target the Royal Train. There was no intention to hurt or kill anybody. There never was. There was a hole in the, in the ground, uh, not a very deep hole, and there was a pair of shoes uh, alongside the hole where the person had been blown up out of his shoes. Uh, <clears throat> it was dark there, and you could not identify anything that you found. Um, I think the, uh, it, we had to wait until daylight, really, to find the extent of it, but you, we knew that there were two persons. On the day the world's media focused on the investiture, two of John Jenkins's operatives were found to have blown themselves up with a bomb Jenkins himself had made. An officer put his head in and said, well, we got two of the bastards last night. I went down to the sounds mess to find out what was happening, and all they had on was bloody cricket or tennis or something. So I had to sit there through all that. So I had acted if nothing had happened, and laugh and drink with them all and joke about it and stuff like that. And it was several hours later I discovered which group it was. As the programme went on air, 
two unexploded devices still remained in Carnarvon. There's the Prince of Wales. He's got out of the train now and into his carriage wearing the uniform of the Colonel-in-Chief of the Royal Welsh Regiment. With him is the Secretary of State for Wales. We would be untrue to history if we did not say everyone, including the Royal Party, everyone held their breath until the thing was over. There was a team of three uh, commentators on Radio Wales and I was situated on top of the Chamberlain Tower in the castle. Now he moves off into town, we shall pick him up in just a few minutes when he's entering the outskirts of Carnarvon itself. And there, out at Griffith's Crossing, Majesty the Queen. When the Queen arrived in Griffith's Crossing, and came off the train, there was to be a 21-gun salute. We had instructions. Whoever was on the air when the royal salute began was to cue back to me, and I would say immediately, jump in and say, now you heard that, that, that gun go off. That was, the, that was the first of the 21-gun salute signaling the fact that the Queen has now arrived in Wales and is on her way into Carnarvon. And we got into our commentary scene setting. Uh, myself in the castle, John down behind the dais, Glyn out and the mice where there were thousands of people. And suddenly and rather unexpectedly there was this boom. And so Glyn, fair play, did exactly as he, we had arranged. He handed back to me and I said, jumped in quickly and said, there you are, he said, you've just heard the first gun of the 21 gun salute. Now we'll listen to the other 20 uh, guns. Absolute silence, nothing. It was quite clearly a bomb, but Prince Charles just looked at me and said, what was that, Mr. Thomas? So I said, Royal salute, Prince Charles. And he looked at me with a question mark in his eyes and he said, peculiar royal salute. <laughs> and I know North Wales will forgive me because I said, peculiar people up here, sir, I had to say something <laughs> to cover up. And we both laughed. I said, ah, well, evidently that wasn't the first gun of the 21-gun salute. And then I looked over my shoulder and I just saw a plume of smoke on the, on the hill behind the, the other side of the, the harbour and some people running around. And in fact, it had been uh, a bomb, maybe a diversionary bomb, but it was a bomb. Now, what we're looking at now is uh, an incident of some kind. Somebody's... I heard an explosion just a little moment ago. We thought that one of the guns had gone off accidentally. There could just possibly have been an explosion. The bomb, planted by Mac in the Chief Constable's garden on Love Lane, had detonated as planned, throwing the traditional 21-gun salute into disarray. Now, here's the Queen, following up behind her son and just on the outskirts of the town with a full sovereign's escort. The Queen is utterly prenaturally calm. Nothing, nothing can flap her. I mean, the Queen herself was very nervous when she went through the coronation. She was very nervous about the ceremonial, very nervous about the fact that if you put a foot wrong on TV, it'll never be forgotten. So how must Prince Charles feel going into this impossible new ceremony. A young man, he's not king yet, he's a long way from that responsibility, and he's young, and he's nervous, and he takes things incredibly seriously. If he puts a foot wrong, he will really take it terribly to heart and feel he's made a dreadful mistake. Lord of the Isles, 
and great steward of Scotland, Prince of Wales and Earl of Chester, and to the same our most dear son, Charles Philip Arthur George, have given... And so the story goes, whether true or false, that the, the coronet designed by the Garter King of Arms and Louis Osman, that the bauble at the, the centre of the coronet malfunctioned just days before the investiture. And so rather than fuse the original bauble back at the centre of the coronet, what instead they had was a, was a ping pong ball wrapped in gold leaf, uh, which made it there on the day. The symbol of sovereignty. I'm not totally convinced by the story. I think it's one that the, uh, the tabloid press ran with a few years ago. Am hynny ar ei wylltysiwn ac ar hoddwn o'r chymyn cae ar ein rhan ni. Fe o'r sbrydolwyd pob un o'r bobl hyn. Mae o'n rhyw ffordd neu gilydd gan y trefthedau hon. The one big tension point, of course, was after the actual investiture, when the Queen and the Prince of Wales went up and to the wall of the castle overlooking the mice and uh, were being presented to the people, as it were. But once they appeared on the balcony, everybody was holding their breath. As the newly crowned Prince of Wales proceeded towards his public, one of Max bombs remained undetonated in the streets of Carnarvon. We can only guess at what her feelings were in that moment when she presents her boy to the people. And they're there in this kind of raw, exposed, beautiful, but very vulnerable space. And she's giving him to risk exposure danger. There is no mistaking spontaneous applause and this is the real thing. At the end of Investiture Day there are, there are two Mac devices which have yet to activate, which should have activated at some point during the Investiture Day. The first which John claims was, was placed at Clandidno Pier as a way of preventing Prince Charles from stepping off from the Royal Yachts Britannia onto the pier to begin the Royal Tour of Wales, which apparently is never found. Or is found, but the, the authorities have denied any knowledge of it. But the other device in Carnarvon is then activated on the 5th of July, five days after the investiture, when 10-year-old Ian Cox, who's on holiday from England, goes to retrieve his ball, it's gone, it's gone behind a wall, kicks out at what he thinks is an old lamp stand. It activates and he, he suffers severe burns and his right leg is amputated. The, the, without question, the low point of this campaign is the injuries to that little boy. The perfectly understandable response is that such injuries to a 10-year-old boy can never be justified, whatever the political cause. Whenever anything failed to detonate, a call was always made to the police to tell them about it and where it is. And this was done, but they didn't take any notice of it, apparently. So I made a point of asking when I was captured eventually, uh, why didn't, didn't you take any notice of the call about the, the bomb? And they said, because it was one of thousands we had on that day, and we couldn't possibly investigate all of them. Such a campaign of, of sort of indiscriminate time devices, um, deaths and injuries are p perhaps inevitable one way or another. Explosions on remote pipelines in the Welsh mountains is one thing. Blood on the streets is quite another. This is as, as bad as it gets. I think, looking back, Charles was the experiment. He was the guinea pig, if you like, in the royal family media project, in the whole, let's get the TV cameras in and show ourselves off. Now, partly, that's a pact with the devil. They have to do it, because that's the commandment, really, of modernity. But it puts them at huge risk. 
He can't go back to being a private royal, a private student ever again. I think John gets a sense that the police are onto him, and so he returns home and finds himself back at Capel Gladys, which has always been a place of sanctuary for him. John said if the pressure was bad leading up to the investiture, after it, it, it was just almost to the, probably unbearable actually. Having lost two colleagues in Mac, owing to a bomb which he had assembled, which he had handed to the cell leader, Alwyn Jones, but if that wasn't bad enough, then he has the, the injuries to Ian Cox five days later. However successful his campaign of disruption had been, these failures were weighing heavily on him. I think he was just relieved, is the impression I get. He, he said it, it almost came as a relief when I heard that knock on the door. Fifty years on, aged 86, John Jenkins is seeing out his days in a nursing home, having forgotten nothing. While history seems to have forgotten him and the war he once waged against the British state, he says his only regrets are the deaths and the casualties that he caused. The investiture thrust Charles into a life lived under constant media scrutiny and intrusion. 50 years on, at the age of 70, he remains a monarch in waiting and the longest serving Prince of Wales in British history. Sean Lloyd asks what the Prince of Wales has done in and for Wales in Charles, Prince for Wales, available on BBC iPlayer. led to two world wars and so on. Young people saying that they wanted a better future for the countries. We want a new order which puts people and their cultures first. So the irony of the investiture is that it happens at the end of the 1960s, the end of a decade of extraordinarily tumultuous politics, decolonization, student revolution, the pill, the expectation of equality. It's absolutely huge. Everybody has changed, and this family wasn't. In their island, what they do is reinstate this antique ceremony, purporting to be about 600 years old, except they've made it up. 